Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I'm speaking to you tonight at a very serious moment in our history. The cabinet is convening and the leaders in Congress are meeting with the president. The State Department and Army and Navy officials have been with the president all afternoon. In fact, the Japanese ambassador was talking to the president at the very time that Japan's airships were bombing our citizens in Hawaii and the Philippines and sinking one of our transports loaded with lumber on its way to Hawaii. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. It was called a death march, not because of how many died. Of the 12,000 Americans, only about 1,700 lived to come home. But they call it a death march because of the way they died. If you stopped on the road, you were killed. If you had a malaria attack, they killed you. If you had to stop to defecate, they killed you. If you just couldn't take another step, they killed you. And how did they kill you? They'd either bayonet you to death shoot you, or in some cases, decapitate you. They did not give us water. They gave us no food. The temperature was about 108 degrees. The, the Americans that were captured, a, a good 80% of them had malaria. Another 50% had dysentery. So we were gunshot wounds, malaria, dysentery, and we had to walk this distance that they wanted us to. Under these conditions, it was, it was unbearable. Hi, everybody. I just uh, was going through tonight and doing some editing on some podcast audio, and I thought I'd get on here and share a little bit of it with you and uh, I was going through and found, uh, you know, I was kind of pulling out a lot of clips about the uh, last letters home, uh, different families that I've interviewed, um, have shared with me the letters that, uh, the MIA or the POW MIA had sent home before their death. And, uh, I thought I'd share a few of these clips with you and kind of give you a little story behind each man. And, and, uh, if you're interested, you can go to our website, uh, podcast.storiesofsacrifice.org and you can listen to each one of them in full. So uh, the first one I'm going to bring you today is uh, we're going to go ahead with, uh, pull it up here. All righty. The first one that we're going to go with tonight is uh, First Lieutenant Carol I. Calhoun. Uh, Carol uh, grew up on a ranch and family on the rangelands of Idaho. He was a member of the Idaho National Guard and later joined the U.S. Army in California. First Lieutenant Calhoun was assigned to the 26th Cavalry, Reg uh, Cavalry Regiment, one of the officers in charge of the Scout Car Platoon. The Scout Car Platoon was responsible for the transportation of men and supplies using light armored cars and trucks. Unfortunately, First Lieutenant Calhoun was killed in action on 7 January 1942 near Lalak Junction on the Bataan Peninsula in the Philippines. Lalak Junction was one of the first lines of defense against the Japanese ground forces on Bataan and provided a delaying action for General Douglas MacArthur to reorganize a better defense. Early in the morning on 7 January 1942, the remaining scout car platoon departed from Lalak Junction and was ambushed soon after at a nearby village. 
The unit returned fire, but the Japanese de detonated a mortar shell against the convoy. First Lieutenant Calhoun and one other, one other American officer were killed in action and later were listed as missing in action. Their remains were not located following the incident, and both are still currently listed as unaccounted for. After the war, American remains were recovered in this area, but not identified, and, and the remains were buried as unknowns at the Manila American Cemetery. Today, First Lieutenant Calhoun's name is memorialized on the walls of the missing at the Manila American Cemetery in the Philippines, and his case is listed as active pursuit by the Defense POWMIA Accounting Agency. Uh, this interview that I did was with his nephew and namesake, Cal Calhoun Boardman, and Cal um, is working on getting his uncle's uh, remains identified. A number of letters that he had sent, not only to my father and to his sister, but also to his mother. I am so grateful to uh, not only my father, but his their mother, who saved these letters, but also the the sisters of, of both boys who were ultimately uh, clearly killed in World War II, who saved them all these years. And, and I feel so honored to be able to read them because it's really through those letters that I've gotten to know Cal Cahoon on a more personal basis. I, I know his record. I've fortunately been able to get his individual disease uh, personnel file from the Army uh, a few years ago, actually. So I knew that, but I didn't know him personally. And he was a, he was a character. He, he described his journeys across on the U.S. Grant. Uh, he described his impressions of the Philippines, uh, and particularly his impressions of, of the land and of the Philippine scouts. There are a number of folks that if we have time, uh, I'd like to read to you some because they just, I think, exemplify the incredible training and culture of the Philippine Scouts. Oh, yeah. We, um, we've got time if you want to read some of them, definitely. Well, all right. Let me, while I'm telling you this, let me see if I can kind of find a little bit of them. All right. Here, here we go. What she did. Uh, the, her, their mother has saved these letters and so most of them are addressed dear mom here is one that he wrote to to his mom I'm just going to quote a few of them and uh, just because I, I think they're beautifully descriptive of the Philippines in in early 1941 dear mom here are a few snapshots that might interest you this place is almost like a summer resort. It's everything I imagined, including hot. Traffic drives on the left side here, which is rather confusing. Cars also have a steering wheel on the right side. Orchids grow wild here. Beautiful flowers of all descriptions grow here the year round, and the singing birds never go south. Native Filipinos wear as little as possible. Shoes are considered a nuisance. Older children are required by law to be at least half covered. They are the top half. Young ones go naked. Everyone sleeps an hour or two after lunch, siesta time, and no one ever hurries. Time is of no importance. Something that strikes me as novel is the length of time Filipinos have to work at anything before he is considered worthwhile. One of the officers was helping me select a cook yesterday. He asked his own houseboy if the prospective cook was any good. His houseboy shrugged his shoulder and, and replied, maybe so, I don't think so. He only cooked 15 years. The Filipino usually serves 21 years in the Philippine Scouts before he is made sergeant. About a week ago, a buck private with eight years service was promoted to first class private. His friends think he's either a genius 
or the American officers are getting very lax. Write me everything you can think of. Love, Cal. <laughs> Here's another one. This is a shorter uh, segment. We have an excellent regimental CO. The morale of both officers and men is very high. Philippine scout soldiers is a saluting demon. They are very loyal and would do almost anything for their officers. They are very serious in their work. You cannot joke with them like you can with an American soldier. Uh, there's what he talks about the headhunters, but I, I uh, let's see. He's also mentioning that he's learning to speak the language Tagalog, and he puts some Tagalog phrases in his letter that he sent back. <laughs> and this is from the last letter that he wrote. The temperature got down to 90 degrees here last night and caused quite a sensation. Some people actually threatened to wear pajamas to bed. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> people in the United States are probably all worried about the Japs taking the Philippines. We inhabitants of this forsaken tropical paradise don't even give it a second thought. Halam Napogagayan. And I'm sure I didn't pronounce that right. Goodbye now. Right soon. Yours, Cal. As an interesting side note on that, uh, Cal's, uh, you know, the nephew there, his uh, father, the brother to the uh, uh, first lieutenant, uh, Calhoun, uh, Cal's father was also killed in action in France during World War II. So Cal was adopted and uh by uh, his mother had remarried and and uh, uh, he he ended up getting adopted by this by his new father, Mr. Boardman. Um, as a <clears throat> also as a side note, uh, the remains who they think might be associated with uh, First Lieutenant Calhoun have now been disinterred from Manila and are located in the lab in Hawaii, and they're awaiting identification. So, hopefully, in the next six months to a year, we will we'll hear hear about First Lieutenant Calhoun coming home. And actually, uh, the family has asked that uh, um, since Cal's father uh, was is actually buried at the Epinal American Cemetery over in France, um, the family's going to have First Lieutenant Calhoun buried next to next to his father or next to the brother. So it's going to be a, a pretty neat deal. The next one I wanted to bring up was is uh, let me pull him up here real quick for you. It's going to be Major James uh, Jim O'Donovan. And uh, Major O'Donovan <coughs> uh, was the executive officer or the XO of 3rd Battalion, 31st Infantry Regiment. Uh, Major O'Donovan led by example on the front lines during the ill-fated uh, defense of the Philippines. He always packed three pivot pistols. He proved to be an inspiring leader to his men and a very aggressive, courageous fighter. He sustained multiple injuries and was hospitalized at least twice. Before the war, war, he served as a captain in the Army Reserves and was employed full-time as an instructor of military science and tactics at the LaSalle Institute in his hometown of Troy, New York. He had been married nine years to the love of his life, Evelyn Murray. Together, they had five children. He enjoyed boxing and riding, but most of his interests in some way were related to his calling in the military. Major O'Donovan died at POW Camp Cabatatuan and was buried in the camp cemetery. After the war, his remains were not identified and he was buried as an unknown at the Manila American Cemetery. And part of the good news in this story is in December 2019, an unknown grave associated with his remains was disinterred and sent to the DPAA lab in Hawaii for identification. So this is a... Uh, his story of sacrifice and just a few clips that well there's quite a few clips of his uh, last letters home and and also a bunch of letters that were written home to his family um, from the men that he served with a letter written by my grandfather to his one of his brothers and his brothers at that time were not active they were in the army reserves and so he was giving advice on um, military posts that they might try to seek. That was one of two letters that I have written by my grandfather 
prior to the war. And unfortunately, that's the only two letters that we have in our family's possession. Yeah, and it, he was talking about in that in that letter how he'd arrive at, he'd be arriving to Manila tomorrow night, at which time I will get my assignment to a regiment. The three possible assignments are the 31st Infantry and two regiments of the Philippine Scouts. This may be an excellent chance to get into the regular army as I will be here two years. So he was really planning ahead for his career. Yeah, uh, I think that he, his next move after this post in the Philippines was a full time um, in the army. And I, I know from what my mom has told me that he had planned uh, to retire from the, from the army. Also, she thought that he probably would have gone into politics had he survived the war. Yeah, it kind of sounds like it. And I really, I really appreciate kind of what he wrote uh, after he got in and he was assigned to the 31st. Uh, in his in the letter, he talks about how uh, a lot of the, the the regular and reserve officers were losing their commissions uh, due to yep. due to drinking and inefficiencies. You know, yep. at, at that time, uh, the Philippines was known as the Pearl of the Orient, and uh, it was pretty wha- uh, laid back and relaxed type of a post. In fact, uh, a lot of a lot of people fought over getting to go over there uh, because it was such a great great place to be. Yeah. Yeah, that was a pretty good quote. Uh, also, he was uh, expecting to be in the thick of it since he was in the 31st. And um, I like how he puts in his letter, if we move out, I'll probably be promoted. So here's hoping. In any case, if you hear of U.S. troops being engaged in the Far East, I'll be in it probably as battalion commander. <laughs> and then it came true. It came true for him, yeah. too. Yeah. So when he first, when he first arrived there, then they, they actually assigned him to the 31st infantry, uh, being the S three, which was the regimental training officer. Um, so he held that position for about five months before the war. And then he, he takes over third battalion, 31st infantry after about five months of being there. Um, yeah. And I like how he put in, in his, in his, uh, you know, in his quotes there, he says to put some much needed discipline into it. Yeah. He was, uh, I, mean, I see it all throughout his writings. He's always talking about uh, the need for training and preparation. Uh, and, and I mean, he's a, uh, that, that was his job, the regimental training officer for the 31st. Uh, but no doubt that he felt that uh, their lives were going to depend on their preparedness. And when the, the Japanese came up and they ended up having more cannons with greater range. And so they pretty much outclassed the artillery capabilities of the American troops. I was going to say, wasn't, oh, go ahead. wasn't there a quote that he, that he mentions uh, about that, about oh. that, uh, that was like an eight hour uh, artillery attack. And he kind of, he's, yeah, he's kind of thinking back to his, his father and his father during world war one. And he kind of, kind of described it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so he, my grandfather was quoted by Donald G young, who was a captain in L company. And, this was uh, written about him after the war, but he quoted my grandfather as saying, it was a greater concentration of artillery fire than during the Meuse-Argonne campaign of 1718 or 1917 to 1918, where the Allied field artillery pieces were lined up hub to hub. So he was comparing uh, this attack from the Japanese to artillery battles in World War One that his grandfather, that his own father was a big part of. So the Americans were getting softened up by the Japanese artillery for eight hours. And then came the Japanese uh, infantry attack, which was able to basically force back Company B of 1st Battalion. And they ran for the hills, pretty much. And so General Steele, who was the regimental commanding officer, ordered 3rd Battalion to basically fill the gap. Says uh, James J. O'Donovan, Major of 31st, Infantry Executive Officer, 3rd Battalion, 31st Infantry. During the counterattack made by the 3rd Battalion, 31st Infantry near Layak Junction, Batan Province, Philippine Islands, on January 6, 1942, Major O'Donovan set a fine example for the attacking elements by his bravery under severe enemy fire. Major O'Donovan's leadership and bravery under fire were important contributing factors to the success of the attack. Yeah, so... So I was, you know, that he was awarded the silver star for that action. And that's, you know, the, our country's third highest award there. 
uh, for for yeah. uh, valor in combat. Because the terrain in the 2nd Battalion's zone was overgrown with dense vegetation and segmented by ravines and ridges, soldiers became separated from their comrades. In one such incident, Privates Michael J. Campbell, Albert Taylor, and George Bullock of G Company found themselves isolated when their platoon fell back under enemy mortar and small arms fire. Joining a five-man patrol from an adjacent company, the group advanced deeper into enemy territory only to be stopped by a sudden burst of fire that wounded five members of the patrol. Japanese troops advanced on their exposed position, moving in short rushes preceded by grenade attacks. Tenaciously clinging to his position for two hours, Private Campbell and his comrades picked off at least 12 of the enemy trying to overrun them. Campbell withdrew only after the wounded reached safety and after receiving a direct order from his commanding officer to withdraw. And the commanding officer was O'Donovan. And um, the last uh, one from Captain Donald G. Thompson, the letter to my grandfather, he wrote, he went out on patrols seeking information of the Japs. He was fearless and gained much valued information. He was wounded in the arm on one of these patrols, reported to the hospital, had his arm fixed, and reported back to the battalion for more duty, all in one day. So that was the Purple Heart, which happened on uh, January 17th. I believe that was the uh, second day on the line, because they were on the line January 16th to the 25th. Now, I can go ahead and read for you the... uh, Distinguished Service Class Citation. This was for, um, this was given to him after the action at Abakai Hacienda. You know, they had to basically have a phased withdrawal from the line. And in order to do that, they have uh, a small force that is trying to represent themselves as the full uh, enemy so that most of the guys can escape. So these, these small representative forces referred to as a shell, and they're supposed to basically pretend to be a large force so that most of the other force can escape. And here's here's what he received the citation for. Um, James J. O'Donovan, Major, 31st Infantry, for extraordinary heroism in action in the vicinity of Abukai Hacienda, Bataan, Philippine Islands, during the period January 20th to 24th, 1942. During the four-day Battle of Abukai Hacienda, Major O'Donovan was serving as battalion executive officer. His constant exhibition of bravery and effective leadership in frontline positions under intense rifle fire, machine gun, mortar, and artillery fire was a significant factor in the successful resistance of his unit. On the night of January 24th, Major O'Donovan, in command of a covering shell of three depleted companies, was charged with securing the withdrawal of his regiment. Shortly after the withdrawal was underway, a general attack was launched by the enemy. Again, his competent leadership and exhibition of bravery in the most advanced positions contributed to the efficient accomplishment of his mission and the consequent successful withdrawal of the regiment. Uh, Yes, what I know about my grandfather uh, during the march was written by two letters. One was from... um, Major Donald G. Thompson, again, a friend of my grandfather's during the war, and also another letter that was written by A.B. Abraham to my great uncle. So I have kind of a, uh, and also A.B. Abraham wrote something about my grandfather in his book, um, oh, let's see, Oh God, Where Art Thou? And um, two books, but um, he wrote about my grandfather in one of his books, um, or both of his books, multiple times. So what I know happened was that uh, Donald Thompson and my grandfather, Major Donovan, reconnected on the death march. And at that time, my grandfather was leading a column of soldiers. Uh, I don't know how that works. I don't know what authority he retains, um, you know, leading a gr- bunch of uh, captives uh, to their prison camp. But for whatever reason, he was setting the pace. and. Uh, A.B. Abraham describes that the Japanese guard thought that his pace was too slow and he tried to encourage him to speed up. And because my grandfather, 
essentially refused. He was beaten in the face, or I think as AB describes that he was punched in the face. Um, oh Jesus! So yeah, that's uh, some uh, some abuse of my grandfather on the death march. That's I'm sure he was. Set, uh, that, I'm sure he's setting the pace for his men. I mean, at this time, uh, a lot of these men were all sick with malaria, dysentery, beriberi. They had so many tropical diseases that uh, it, you know, even even a small crawl would have been hard for them. And I'm sure your grandfather was trying to look out for the men in his column to um, so nobody was left behind. And and probably yeah. one of the reasons why is because you know when 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 one of these men would fall out of line try to take a break the japanese would uh, you know a lot of them were shot and bayoneted so i'm sure your grandfather was trying to look out for his men and the men in his column yeah i, I agree that's that's uh, ab abraham's assessment he says as much um in his book i do have a quotation uh from a letter that donald wrote about that event this is donald thompson again he said the night after our surrender i found jim in the column marching out of Bataan on what has come to be known as the Death March. Again, this letter is written to my grandmother, so she might not have known about that. I, so I joined him and we marched, slept, marched for four days and nights on that long trip to Camp O'Donnell, our first prisoner of war camp. Jim had malaria from the second day and was a very sick man, but he refused to let me or anyone else carry his pack. He said he was a soldier and a good soldier carries his own load. Yeah. So, uh, marching on the death march with malaria, uh, especially after fighting on frontline positions for four months with quarter rations, must have been a real treat. Yeah, and, and being wounded, you know, in the process too. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's these men were, you know, I would, I would, I would describe it from what the stuff that I've read. I would describe all these men as the Walking Dead. Yeah, they are they are described that way, and in, in, uh, I'm not sure which book, but many many books talks about the men on the Abakai Hacienda line of defense as the Walking Dead. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's um, there's a story that I think is worth uh, reading. Just to return real quickly back to the uh, day six on the Abakai Hacienda line. Oh, please do. It, yeah, and the story is um, about my grandfather burning down the sugarcane trees. I came across this book in um, called Death March, The Survivors of the Tan. And it's written by a guy named a PFC Wilburn Snyder. This is just one of many accounts of the same event. So I'll read this to you because it's pretty interesting. Uh, he writes, quote, the sugarcane at Abakai Hacienda was tall enough to gather. It was also tall enough to hide the Japs who used to infiltrate our lines. So one of our officers, a major, decides to burn down the cane fields, and he puts himself, he gets himself some gasoline and starts to burn them down. Now, this major was a good officer. He doesn't say, private, you go out there and set the cane fields. Instead, he does it himself. He always wore two thirty eight. Well, he spreads this gasoline all throughout the cane field so he can really get it burning. Whether he banged the two cans together, causing a spark or what, I don't know. But while he's in the cane field, it starts on fire. Huge conflagration. All we knew was he was in there, but no one could go in to get him. The fire was so hot. Then all of a sudden, he steps out of the flame, and all he's wearing are those 238. He done had all his clothes burned off. Holy Man. cow. Yeah. Man, we ran up to him and said, Major, we've got to get you back to the hospital. Hospital, he said, all I need is some new clothes. Oh. This, um, this, he, Wilburn doesn't actually mention my grandfather's name, uh, in this. So, uh, it's kind of, it's slightly circumstantial, except that there are a couple other accounts that describe the same exact scenario and it, it does mention him, uh, by name. So we're figuring that it would be highly unlikely that it's somebody else with almost the same description. That's um, crazy. That's crazy. You know, I'm surprised he wasn't awarded a Medal of Honor for all the stuff that he did at that, in that engagement. I mean, that's 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 putting your life yeah. above everything else. Yeah, that's that's a that's a heck of a good story there. You know, of a, of a brave hero. Um, 
I'm surprised he wasn't awarded the Medal of Honor for a lot of the stuff that he did. Uh, if you go back into, you know, his military records and history, it, it's it's amazing that he wasn't awarded one. Um, but like I said, the good news is that uh, here in the next six months to a year, hopefully, uh, we'll be hearing from the DPAA that he's been identified uh, and brought home. And uh, I got one more that I want to share with you all. Um, his name is uh, <clears throat> Private Israel Goldberg. Now, Private Goldberg, let me pull him up. Private Israel Goldberg, just a sec. Goldberg. Okay. Go ahead and share it with you all here. Application. All righty. Private Israel Goldberg was born in Massachusetts. He was the son of Russian immigrants who served with Headquarters Squadron, 24th Pursuit Group, U.S. Army Air Corps in the Philippines. Uh, when the Philippines was attacked by the Japanese, Private Goldberg was then assigned to the Provisional Air Corps Infantry. Uh, this infantry unit uh, was made up of all uh, U.S. Army Air Corps airmen who were retrained as infantry soldiers who fought on the front lines in the defense of Bataan. When the Bataan forces were surrendered, he was among those who endured the 65-mile Bataan death march to the northern POW camps of O'Donnell and Cabatatuan. Private Israel Goldberg died at the notorious Cabatatuan POW camp on 11 August 1942 and was buried in Common Grave 108 in the camp cemetery along with nine other POWs who died that day. His uh, great niece is the one that tells us his story. Uh, her name is Liberty, Liberty Phillips. Uh, she is the founder and director of the nonprofit Operation Meatball. And she tells us his story and his family's determination to have him identified. Um, I would like to say, too, that uh, this is a case that I just started working on, on Grave 108 where I've identified the other P families, descendants of the POWs that was buried with him. And I'm currently in the process of reaching out to all those families to get them to provide DNA uh, to the Defense POW Accounting Agency to uh, hopefully get all these guys identified. So this is the my latest case that's uh, active and ongoing. Um, so here's a, a little clip of his last letter home. So there's not a lot of information between what happened when he got over to the Pacific. He was stationed in the Philippines. He was with Headquarters Squadron 24th Pursuit Group at Clark Field. Yeah. And I don't have, I've seen some of his letters. I don't, there's not a lot, but what he sends is actually, it was really enlightening in a way on what was going on in the mindset. I just, I think most of us kind of assume that the war starts at Pearl Harbor Day on December 7th. But in this letter I have from him, um, October 30th, 1941, so like a month and a half, like hardly a month before Pearl Harbor, he is writing his family and he's talking about an upcoming, something is about to break out. So if, if you don't mind, I'll read you the letter he wrote. Oh, we'd love to hear kind it, of yeah. Give you a, kind of give you a picture into Israel and what's going on. So mm -hmm. he says, Dear Gert, Fred, and baby Howard. So Gertrude is his sister. Fred is my great-grandfather. Gertrude and Fred are my great-grandparents. And baby Howie is my grandfather. So he says, Dear Gert, Fred, and baby Howie, how are you all? I'm feeling fine. Right now, my address is the above one. I don't know how long I'll be here, but write this address anyhow. The situation around here is tense, to put lightly, and we are not expecting the best. However, we feel that there will be a showdown sooner or later, so the sooner the better. Right now I'm making $46 a month and expect to make more very soon. I'm saving at least $10 a month and save more if I can. If I ever get out of here in one piece, and I expect to, this boy is going to blow himself to a good time when he gets back to the state, as I'm putting my money into the U.S. Army finance. Things must be booming right along at home. I hope Fred is getting his share. Baby Howie needs shoes, you know. The baby must be a cute rascal now. How he gets, how does he get along? 
with Zada and how is Zada? Give him my regards. I sent him a couple of cards lately. I'm working in the group headquarters personnel section right now, and I'm getting to be quite a clerk. I keep the records of all the officers in the group. They go strong for all the insurance they can get. An insurance man paradise? I'll close this letter now because I haven't much more time to write. I give my regards to Barbara and Sonny, Denny, Abe. In fact, to all the little and big Goldbergs, Nelson, Phillips, and to all my family. Tell Zada and Pa not to worry, as ever, Uncle Sewell. P.S. Don't forget regards to Zada. So there's kind of a, an inside family joke in this letter, which when I read this, I, I was just, I don't know, I got this amazing feeling that, okay, I know my uncle. So he, he talks about an insurance man's paradise. And one of the fam, one of our family things is that my grandfather and my great grandfather, a bunch of my relatives were all insurance men, but they were terrible businessmen because they gave away as much insurance as they sold. You know, they just wanted to help people. So it was kind of a joke. He's like, here, everybody out here, they want insurance. So that's his letter from October 30th, 1941. And there had been he one other telegram he'd sent um, earlier that year where he just says he's doing fine. But that's the last letter we have from him. Well, anyway, that's uh, that was Private Israel Goldberg's uh, great niece, uh, Liberty Phillips. And uh, I, I just wanted to bring you kind of give you some highlights of uh, our podcast story of sacrifice. Um, I put the link down below there so you all can see it. If uh, please visit it. And then if you have a move day or something where you're bored and want to listen to some good stories, um, take some time and listen to the, the, you know, about these heroes and what they gave for our country. So I just wanted to bring this to you real quick. Just give you a brief introduction to it, to our podcast and kind of what I'm doing. And, and uh, hopefully we'll be bringing these uh, inter, inter, uh, interviews uh, to you, to everyone here, uh, on video, video, as well as through the podcast channel. So, um, thanks for taking time to watch this. And if you don't mind, uh, leave us some comments down below and tell me what you thought about it. And if you have a chance to go to the podcast and listen, listen to them, uh, give me, give me some feedback on those too. Uh, I'm always looking to improve what I'm doing. And, um, like I said, my biggest, uh, thing that I want to do here is, is tell these stories and, you know, keep their memories alive. So thanks for joining me. And then uh, we will uh, talk to y'all again real soon.